Can you tell me a little bit about channel factors? Uh, well, this is an idea that's very old in social psychology. You might be interested to know, I don't think most social psychologists know this, the field of experimental social psychology was founded by a physicist. Uh, and that has everything to do with the fact that social psychologists are the ones who are telling us what the situations are that people confront that are going to have an impact on them. His notion was the field, that, that social psychologists focus on the field, that, and that comes from field theory and physics. I mean, you need to know what's going on the whole field. I mean, it's just uh, in order to, to understand uh, how to explain behavior. He had a notion that uh, sometimes we, we want someone to do something or want some kind of outcome, we just push across the way and say, no, wait, look, there may be a channel there through which you can, which you can, you can achieve what you're trying to achieve. Think about, think about what situational barriers you might remove. Think about how the, you could give the person a plan uh, that would help them to go in a direction you want them to go. One of the channel factors that I find interesting is this idea of, of organ donation. And it's such a simple, tiny manipulation of, uh, seemingly tiny manipulation of um, opting in or opting out of, mm -hmm. of organ donation. Is that, do you know the details or? Well, uh, I, uh, I know as much about it as most social psychologists who've read the study and thought yeah. about it. Uh, for many of us, it's a very, powerful uh, demonstration of what Kurt Levine called uh, a channel factor. That is something that made it a little easier to act in a accord with your, uh, with your preferences or your values. But uh, I think there was a, a many, many interesting features in that. But the starting point is just that this is a case of what we would, might call a natural experiment. It wasn't a study in which someone manipulated this, although uh, people have followed up on it, yeah. including me <laughs> and uh, my colleagues. Uh, but uh, the finding, as I think uh, most people in psychology are aware now, is that if you looked at European countries, and some of those countries had a policy where you had to sign the back of your license, your driver's license to make you a potential organ donor. In other places, you had to sign if you didn't want to be a potential organ donor. So the phenomena was incredibly dramatic. I mean, you found countries as similar as Austria and Germany or Norway and uh, Sweden uh, having tremendously different rates, uh, under 10% of people in some cases and over 95 and others, very, very dramatic. So it's tempting. A lot of people look at that and say, well, just people are lazy. Yeah. But it was subtler than that. Uh, and there's a stunning experiment, a very old experiment, done with Yale college students. Uh, there was uh, a social psychologist uh, who uh, was scaring the daylights out of these undergraduates about tetanus. I mean, he shows them people with the extremes of lockjaw and the terrible kinds of things that can go on. He says, look, it's not just the rusty nail you've heard about. I mean, it's all over. I mean, it's just, you know, you, uh, you, just, you, don't, you don't recognize how susceptible you are. But not to worry, because you can go to the health service, which will be available on Tuesday morning, and you're going to get an inoculation. Uh, 3% of students go and get their inoculations, even though they're manifestly scared and they believe this. Uh, to other students, he gives them a map and says, uh, and, and the, the health service is circled on it. Now these are, by the way, Yale seniors. They know where the health service is. So, but he circles it on the map anyway. He says, where will you, when would be a convenient time on Tuesday morning for you to go get an inoculation? And I said, well, I don't know, 10 o'clock when I'm coming out of my chemistry class. I say, okay, where is you, would you mark where your chemistry class is on that map? And then would you draw me a, the line from there to the chemistry? Now the compliance rate is 29%. It's this little trivial situational factor channel that he creates has a massive impact on behavior. And of course, you know, not to get back to this dispositional versus situational explanation, here's Joe who went to get a tetanus inoculation and Sam who didn't. 
uh, why did Joe, oh, he's very conscientious, he's very health concerned, and <laughs> Sam, why did he, he, uh, he, why did he not do it? Oh, you know, he's kind of, he's the sort of guy that doesn't care that much, he's kind of irresponsible, kind of flighty, really. Um, so <laughs> here's a situational factor that affects the, what goes on by a factor of nine, and I'm, and I'm going to attribute it as the observer. I'm going to attribute the difference to their personalities. So this idea of channel factors um, that you mentioned with respect to the Milgram experiment and others, um, it's extremely powerful. I mean, it, it's, and I think it, people aren't really kind of taking advantage of it as far as um, in the Occupy movement or in climate change and so on. In, in trying to motivate a large number of people to do one particular thing, they don't really seem to be taking advantage of, of the situation as much as they could. Is that, is that well, true? Well, uh, I think uh, the message has started to uh, become much better understood, uh, actually. Uh, we're seeing in education a number of uh, really dramatic cases where relatively small changes in the situation facing students, uh, just giving messages about whether they belong and whether the institution has confidence that they can succeed. And we see big effects of these kinds of manipulations. Certainly politicians have gotten the message. Uh, to some extent it's been negative in the sense that they no longer worry about persuading people. They just say, how can we identify the folks who are likely to be our voters and make them get to the polls? It was interesting in the last election, I don't think it's a big secret that uh, Barack Obama uh, had the assistance of a number of behavioral psychologists and behavioral economists and uh, who used uh, a number of different uh, techniques to initially identify and then make sure their voters would actually get to the polls. And they did this in in very, very sophisticated ways, such that uh, on the night of the election, uh, the Republican strategists were uh, shocked and were convinced that the prediction models uh, were, uh, that they had were correct and the early polling was wrong because they were saying, given everything we know about the economy and given what we know about popularity ratings and given what we know about the frequency with which particular ethnic or demographic groups vote, what's going to happen? And what they didn't realize was that an experimental manipulation had been done. Some very, very clever and powerful techniques had been used to make people who were favorably leaning but not likely voters to actually vote. And what were those? What did they do? Ah, uh, <laughs> that's a secret. <laughs> right. <laughs> but um, if you read the history of social psychology, you'd be able to predict. I mean, I could imagine a couple of them. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, one is getting early commitment, getting people who say they're going to vote. Uh, you say, "Can we count on you? Yep. Uh, can we call you back on election day and make sure you voted?" Or in getting them to register. Uh, instead of saying, will you go register, you say, okay, let's do it right now. Take out your cell phone and make this call and someone will come and pick you up. I mean, there's many, many things yeah. that you can do. But the point was to, uh, to make sure that people who generally were disposed to behave in a particular way, uh, but often in history have not done so, in this case, they would and they could be counted on. My name is Lee. I think about wisdom.